Hi, everybody. My name is Stephen Rothstein. I want to welcome you. You're, I'm your MC for today's live stream series 2020 digital program. I'm the managing director of the series accelerator for sustainable capital markets. This is a new center at series that's working to transform the practices and policies that govern capital markets in order to accelerate action on reducing the worst impacts of climate crisis and other sustainability th threats. Before we jump into today's important discussion, we want to say that all of us are series, at series, our hearts go out to those who have been seriously affected by the corona pandemic. We're especially grateful for those on the front lines risking so much each and every day to ensure that the rest of us stay as safe and, health, and healthy as possible. I also want to thank each of you for participating today. We know that your personal and professional lives have been profoundly disrupted, and your participation demonstrates the unflappable commitment to our collective mission of building a just and sustainable economy. We also appreciate the generous support of our speakers and sponsors who have stood by us on this digital journey to reimagine Series 2020. Together, we've been able to transform our intended in-person event to a digital program. We clearly, clearly could not do this without your support. This pandemic has not only dramatically changed our world and our way of life, but it's, it's shining a light on our universal interconnectedness and our vulnerability to the systemic risks that have rocked our capital market system. Whether it be the deadly virus or the climate crisis, we're experiencing firsthand the need for collective action. This is where you, as those, those speaking and those listening, as policymakers and regulators, are uniquely positioned to positively influence our response. And we hope that your leadership will be seen by your colleagues as they consider the financial uh, risks or a rapidly global, uh, warming planet. Your individual and collective leadership is more important today than ever. Um, before we start today's sessions, I have a few housekeeping notes. First, please note that today's session is being recorded. We'll be providing this link to all participants shortly after the completion. Second is if you have questions, please answer, please put them in the chat box that's located on your control panel on the right. We'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible at the end of the session. Third, please note that the potential of global bandwidth issues that may we may affect may affect us. Unfortunately, it's beyond our control. If it happens, the discussion will pause for 30 seconds while we let the bandwidth to adjust. We appreciate your flexibility. Now, we are, we're really honored to have the speakers with us. We have three with them now, and a fourth will be joining in, in just a, a few minutes. We have Carla, the Honorable Carlos Corbano, the former Republican congressman from Florida and the principal of Ocara and LLC in Florida. We have the Honorable Sarah Raskin, Professor at Duke, former governor of the Federal Reserve, and former deputy secretary of the Treasury, and the Honorable Michael Creedler, the Washington State Insurance Commissioner and chair of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners Risk, Climate, and Resiliency Tra Task Force. And shortly, uh, we'll be having Senator Sheldon Whitehouse join us. Uh, he is uh, stuck in another meeting and will be joining us very shortly. So I first want to start with our with Sarah Raskin and the commissioner to talk from a regulatory side, and then we'll welcome Carlos in just a few minutes. But first, thank you all of you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, Sarah Raskin, Commissioner Craig, let's start with what do you think is the role of state and federal financial regulators in addressing climate crisis? Sarah, we'll start with you. Sure, thank you, and thank you for um, inviting me, and thank you to all the listeners out there who are um, uh, really um, important parts of what tasks lie ahead here for us. I mean, I think one thing that we are seeing um, through the pandemic is uh, really how an, how an invisible enemy can totally upend a society and upend an economy. And um, so this notion really of addressing climate, the climate uh, emergency through uh, the tools that exist today, I, I think could not be stronger. Um, the case is really being um, underscored in a way that maybe it hadn't 
been before. But uh, the pandemic really reminds us of a lot of very integral, uh, integral things. It's it's it, it it has exposed us, for example, to the fact that. Um, uh, the best paid people uh, may not be the most essential, um, that the U.S. in particular is vulnerable to shocks that hit our collective well-being, like health and climate. Um, we see that financial markets can't perform the work of assuring collective well-being. Um, and we've also learned that the magnitude of a crisis is determined not just by the impact of precipitating events, but by the fragility of the system that it attacks. So I think the world has really been forced into a recalibration of values. And for that reason, the timing really of this discussion could not be more important. Now to your um, individual question, Stephen, about the, you know, about the role of regulators um, in all of this, I think the role is really quite vast. Um, a lot of the authorities that both state and federal regulators have uh, may not have been put in place, particularly with an eye to climate change and climate and the climate emergency. And yet the jurisdiction of some of these authorities is quite broad and quite expansive um, and permits really a very uh, close look at the tools that are available. So for example, um, you know, I would uh, really think about this task really in two ways. One, I would, I would recommend that regulators at both the state and the federal levels bear witness bear witness to really what is happening in your in your states, in your jurisdictions, in your localities uh, as it pertains to climate. That is that I think is the first thing um, and how essentially the climate change risk that we are living in is going to affect the financial sector or the sectors that you are uh, that you are overseeing. Um, secondly, I would review the tools that you have at your disposal. Uh, the tools really are quite um, quite uh, um, uh, available, um, and they are vast. And so if you think about the tools either from a regulatory perspective or a disclosure perspective um, or a perspective that requires some kind of stress testing regime, I think that you will find that there's a way to connect your existing um, authorities with the emergency at hand. So um, I think I think there is quite a bit there. That's very thoughtful. There's a lot of meat there. Uh, Mike, your thoughts? Well, Stephen, it, insurance regulation is a little bit different than what we have with uh, the banking world, at least in the U.S. Um, insurance is is regulated at the state level uh, in the U.S., whereas uh, internationally you find it much more commonly done. Uh, at the at the federal level and and uh, and even to the north in Canada and or south to Mexico, you see the same. Um, so it is really up to each state, but we're going to be principally really focused on maintaining the integrity of the market. And that's where uh, climate change can have a very profound uh, impact on the stability of that market if uh, if keen observation and adjustment for changes that are taking place are not taking place uh, in the reg from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, solvency of the insurance companies is critical. Uh, we need to make sure that they're making the right kind of investments uh, that aren't going to be in jeopardy, that are, are uh, cautious, uh, stable investments today, but are very risky tomorrow. And we've already seen how quickly uh, the world of coal can change uh, very dramatically in a fairly short period of time and not driven by, unfortunately, the awareness of uh, climate change and, and carbon in the atmosphere, uh, but because of competition with another uh, carbon producer, which is natural gas, um, which is cheaper. Uh, so we can, but if you've invested in coal, you could pay the price for it. We want to make sure that the markets themselves remain uh, incredibly strong. I mean, in the sense that you have choices out there among uh, different insurance companies. We 
this is a, a free market. Um, we want to make sure that uh, the, uh, we're going to be checking the companies to make sure that they have the, the solvency uh, going forward. And they're making the right kind of investments, but we also want to see that they're the right kind of right kind of competition in the market uh, going forward that uh, allows the kind of choice and and also the kind of price competition that should take place, which really calls for uh, stern oversight and regulation to make sure that companies are following the rules and don't try to uh, uh, shortchange uh, the re on, on on certain critical items uh, such as uh, solvency uh, that they uh, need to make sure that they're staying up, keeping their head above water. And most of all, we're going to be looking for the consumer. The consumer wants to have choices. They want to have the best price and they want to be able to uh, look at the market and be aware of the fact that, that, that there are choices out there that are available to them. Um, and that's, that, so looking out for the consumer's interest is going to be of keen interest. This really comes together when we look at the impacts of climate because as climate unfolds and we start to see the changes that are taking place, uh, that uh, it's an impact on the insurance market and uh, insurance companies really need to be much more focused on the long term, as do the regulators, uh, because we want to maintain competition in the market. We want to maintain choice. We want to make sure the consumers are protected. We can't do that unless uh, the, they, they're staying in the market and looking at it from a long term proposition as opposed to in today, out tomorrow. Uh, this is a short underwriting cycle. Uh, it is a long-term one, and is one that they've got to look at for for uh, uh, decades, as opposed to just looking for the next uh, one year uh, of underwriting. But that those are the challenges of an underwriter, making sure the system works. So you've each talked about so many nuances and elements. We could spend literally the whole hour just on those. But let me ask one question you both kind of alluded to, but do you feel as regulators that that you view uh, and that regulators should view climate as a systemic risk, or is it really, gee, if a company is in a certain area, or it's much bigger than that, just as we are looking at now? Mike, we can start with you and then go back to Sarah. Well, I, I think when it comes to uh, climatic events, uh, I don't anticipate that we're going to see a major shift uh, take place because of a single climatic event. Uh, it's not like uh, uh, like uh, having a major uh, um, volcano activity that uh, or uh, earthquake activity and the like. This this is one where it's going to be uh, single events, uh, largely. Maybe there'll be several of them, but uh, it's going to be over a couple of years or multiple years actually, where we start to see this unfold. Um, so it's it's one where I see it as a systemic risk uh, to the industry. Um, and that's one reason why we've uh, we've worked uh, and, and been successful uh, to include in the examiner's handbook, which applies to all uh, U.S. insurance regulators uh, for for companies, is to make sure that they've uh, they've taken into account uh, the issues around climate. It's not a requirement, but uh, because insurance varies from one product to another. But it is included now in the in the handbook of examiners, and that's that's because we want to make sure that they're taking it into account, and that's where it starts to become uh, truly a, a systemic event over time. And I think that's the the change that we're seeing here. It isn't one single event; it's going to be spread out over time. But if we don't start planning for it now, we won't be ready for it any more than we've been ready right now for yeah. coronavirus. That's very helpful. Sarah? Yeah, I think the commissioner is exactly right. I mean, he puts his finger on um, an important element of the risk as it unfolds, which is that it may not be cataclysmic in the sense that it all happens in one fell swoop. Um, you see in, you know, in the pandemic experience, for example, you see a, a very dramatic um, exponentially magnified set of reactions that occurs almost in the course of 
uh, in the course of days, right? But um, uh, in, in, in the realm of climate, it may evolve differently. I mean, certainly it is something that we're experiencing right now. It's not as if it is somehow, um, you know, been put on hold or essentially that we uh, no longer need to worry about it. I mean, some actually would argue that the pandemic itself is a reaction or is a part of what the uh, climate change um, uh, experience is, is revealing. Um, in terms of the labeling, though, and I know it's very, um, you know, tempting to want to be able to categorize this as a particular kind of risk, and it certainly does have systemic components to it. Um, but I would also um, urge people to consider kind of the uh, the evolving lexicon that is um, developing around climate, and that is to essentially put the risks into two categories. Um, and these again are risks as they pertain to financial stability to financial markets and such. One being physical risk and another category being transition risks. And this has been um, developing, um, I would argue with some good academic support behind it, um, that you know has permitted essentially uh, firms and regulators to start thinking about climate in a way that is uh, quite analytical, quite rigorous, and that will actually um, help, I think, bring about some uh, potentially good regulatory solutions to it. Great. Um, let me ask both of you, um, we're all facing this current crisis, obviously, with corona. What is that, from a regulatory perspective, what is that teaching us, and what will that teach us as we think about the climate crisis going forward? Um, Sarah, if you want to start? Sure. I mean, I think what, what we're experiencing is um, that um, our economy is really quite vulnerable. Um, there is a, a real sense of... Uh, um, linkage between the performance of the economy and and the health of people, that there is an interconnectedness that uh, maybe has not been fully appreciated before, uh, before this crisis uh, emerged. So I think that the um, that 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 what this reveals to us is essentially that there are these fault lines that have existed in our markets, in our actual way of dealing with uh, with 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 issues that have this 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 negative externality on all of us, and that we have to do things ahead of time to address them. That waiting for a major crash and complete flattening of the economy is really too late. It's too late and it's extraordinarily costly. If there is a one lesson, it is like to get ahead. There is an opportunity to here to be ahead of what we are about to and what we are currently experiencing in the realm of climate. And I would urge regulators and um, and, and activists and firms themselves and investors to really uh, seize the moment as, a, as one in which we can really start to understand the need to act proactively. Great. Commissioner? I, I, I think Sarah's right on. I mean, I think this is, uh, this is one where uh, we can look at uh, what, what's happened to, with the uh, uh, coronavirus. And uh, I mean, it's something uh, uh, that we've been aware of for, for, for decades as being a major threat uh, that we were going to see the jump from from uh, from, from animals to, to humans of a virus that we were totally unprepared for. And yet it's almost as if we've got, gone into this current COVID-19 experience as if we were our feet were flat on the ground and we were totally unprepared. We weren't anticipating this and who would have thought type of thing. And Yes, a lot of us have been thinking about this for a long time. And uh, one of our state residents, uh, Bill Gates, has uh, been talking about it for a long period of time, uh, about the, the threat that this represents to us. So yes, it is a great example of the kind of planning and preparation that we need to be doing right now around climate. I, I don't anticipate that we're going to wind up with the, the, the global impact that we're seeing right now with the coronavirus uh, with, with climate. It's going to be a gradual uh, uh, up and down uh, experience, always going up, uh, but, uh, mm -hmm. but trending up, unfortunately, and getting worse. Uh, but 
there are so many opportunities right now that we're going to have as kind of the warning klaxon bell to tell us that we've got to do something. And that's going to be the degree of flooding that's taking place um, just to, in the US itself, much less globally. Um, and and the problems of of, uh, of, of hurricanes and and uh, uh, tornadoes and uh, uh, we don't have them here but uh, hail storms where you have real hail damage that results from it uh, it's very different in the state of Washington but you know what if if we learned one lesson from this coronavirus we're all in the same boat this is planet Earth. And planet Earth is being impacted by a coronavirus, and planet Earth is being impacted by climate change. And we need to approach it that way. We have that opportunity. If we start now, we're going to be very much uh, behind the game, much like we are right now with COVID-19. We can't allow that to be replicated as a model for how we're going to deal with climate. You're, I mean, more powerful words I don't think has ever been said between what both of you just said now. And I agree with you about Washington environment. One of my two sons lives in the state of Washington. And, and uh, before this, he used to get on a plane to visit him fr frequently. We'll see what happens going forward. So you do have great environment. <laughs> Let me ask you, Commissioner, before I go back to Sarah, you're obviously a leader among insurance commissioners in this field. Give us a sense of so some of your counterparts around the country and what's happening overall and their feelings about the issues of climate you know, you know this is a, an activity i i'm the longest serving insurance commissioner in the country uh after i, I left congress at, un unwillingly a few years ago many years ago uh, i wound up uh, being then elected insurance commissioner and so i've been insurance commissioner now for 20 years and i almost started immediately with my interest uh, in this and the discussions and about 10 years ago we started a survey process <clears throat> where we survey all of the companies doing business in the state of Washington, but I do it with my colleagues, and uh, they, they're they're surveying uh, the, the companies that not only are are uh, d domiciled in their uh, particular state or uh, or my state, uh, they're also sur surveying the companies that do business in their state, and because we've always done the survey. Uh, one, the survey was developed by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, but because of politics, it's been difficult to do it as an association. So several of us have carried it forward and done this survey on a routine basis. And because we have New York and California uh, part of the surveying states, in fact, the, the actual documents themselves, the, the survey instrument documents, which, which we've been doing now for 10 years, are, are held in, on servers in, in California through the insurance department of that state. Um, and we, so, so we, we've been able to, to uh, continue to, to press this issue uh, among uh, our, uh, among, one among our peers, but as insurance regulators, which has been very difficult as I think you can all imagine. It's, the word climate change is, is not that many years ago, that there was a there was a governor in in the state of uh, Florida that uh, didn't want to have the word climate change even mentioned, uh, um, and, and at least uh, at least the word was being spread that was the case, and that's so so we've had to approach this fairly delicately in order to try to keep it as one that works together. But we're really starting to see some changes now, um, and one of one of the changes that we've seen is is that. Uh, that we, we are the sustainable insurance form, which was created uh, nationally, internationally, I should say, globally. Um, and, and that's one that uh, California and Washington and, uh, um, and New York have joined and others now, now are joining too. And, and uh, to take it one step further, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, made up of all of the, these regulators, have agreed and has joined uh, that organization. So we're starting to, to see them come forward. It, it isn't important to talk about what caused it. I'm not going to belabor the point as to whether the, the coronavirus came out of uh, uh, China or not. Who cares? It's a problem. We've got to deal with it. Let's see how we solve it. We've got uh, climate change, human caused, uh, 
I think it's pretty clear that it is, but that in fact, it's definite it is. It, it is one that we're, we're, we're talking about that is not important. Coming up with solutions so that we're addressing the buildup of carbon in the atmosphere and the impacts that it's having on all of us and the inevitable impacts it's going to have on this planet uh, going forward. Those are the issues that we should be talking about. And insurance can play an incredibly important part of this. You can't have economic activity without insurance. And that's what we have an opportunity right now to, uh, as an organization. So we're, we're starting to see that kind of change take place, uh, even globally. Um, and uh, so as I, even though it's been a 10 year slog, uh, I think we're starting to see it's starting to pick up. We just have to stay away from some of the hot button words um, because the words start in this case are not critical actions or what matters. And that's what we're, we're, we're geared toward at this time. That's great. That's, that's so important. And, and I know that I as one and series in the field benefits from having you in that leadership role in the insurance regulators for many years. We appreciate it. I think our audience have also seen that uh, U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse has joined, which we appreciate, Senator, you're, you're joining. We're going to get to you and Congressman Carbell in just one second. One final question for former uh, Fed Governor Sarah Raskin. And just help us put what the, what's happening with central banks in context around the world. There are many banks that have taken steps on climate change as compared to some of ours. And if you can just give some overview of what's happening internationally, uh, that would be enormously helpful. Sure. So, um, uh, yes, I'm afraid the, the Federal Reserve is a bit of a laggard when it comes to its counterparts in other places in the world. So the European Central Bank, which is the European counterpart for um, the Fed, um, a very early on um, wanted to figure out how to meld its mission uh, with the uh, with the dire um, risk that climate uh, change presents. Um, and you see uh, certainly from the European Central Bank, you see from the Bank of England, uh, which is the UK uh, uh, counterpart of the Fed, um, even Bank of Japan, you're seeing these very um, robust uh, efforts to understand uh, that there is a linkage between climate and financial stability. And so pre-pandemic, you, I think a lot of very good thought leadership was coming uh, on the regulatory side, on the monetary policy side, um, even on the fiscal side, uh, you know, from the counterparts to the Fed. Uh, there also are these intergovernmental uh, bodies, um, uh, task forces uh, that have sprung up, task forces of international supervisors, task forces of international, you know, central bankers that have come together and, and actually attempted to, uh, to, to develop a lexicon and a way forward using the authorities of bank regulators and central banks around the world. So um, there, there is an effort. Now, um, I would, you know, I'd like to say I don't think all is lost here. I don't think it's too late for the Federal Reserve to to get engaged. Um, you know, I know that they're they're plenty busy right now, but um, you know, even in the context of today's decisions, the things that they are doing today, uh, we really want to make sure that they um, are taking heed of fossil fuels long term weakness when they make their decisions, you know, which they have plenty of in terms of their quantitative easing, in terms of their liquidity facilities, um, they need to look really at, uh, at, at the, at the, at the long-term uh, fossil fuel firm weakness. Um, I don't think we want to see um, the limited uh, resources and recovery uh, responses being wasted on unconditional bailouts on debt relief or on similar supports for oil and gas and petrochemical firms. Um, why? Because essentially we don't want to slow the transition to clean energy. That is what we need to focus on. And the regulators and the central banks have a very important role in, uh, in doing that. And I think they are at a point in time now where they actually have the, uh, have the ability to affect the pace at which we transition to clean energy. And that, of course, is one way you get ahead of the issues that we're talking about. 
So that's I'll great. There. Thank you for that, both context internationally and what our own Federal Reserve can be. And and Sarah and Mike, hope you can stay. I'm going to shift now on the legislative side. And again, welcome uh, Senator Whitehouse and 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 Congressman Carbello. Senator Whitehouse, let me start with you. You've been and continue to be a national leader on climate issues and carbon pricing, whatever. Can you just give, before we talk about regulatory roles specifically, give an overview of what you think is the thinking in Congress now, particularly what's happening with Corona, on climate issues and where the, what you think may or may not happen in the next, in this session or something. Senator? Yeah, so there are um, two background facts that people need to understand. One is that there was a lot of bipartisanship on climate change in the first years that I was in the Senate. I mean, literally year after year after year, there were multiple big, serious bipartisan climate bills that were being worked on. And that that completely came to a stop when the Citizens United decision came down from the Republicans on the Supreme Court. Um, the fossil fuel industry had requested that decision and instantly responded with massive political force. So point one is bipartisanship is very available on climate change. In fact, it was there until the fossil fuel industry used the terrible power of Citizens United spending to suppress that. Uh, the second thing is that when the fossil fuel industry went to work, the rest of corporate America did not push back. There was a deafening silence from everybody else in corporate America. They basically left the issue of climate change to the fossil fuel industry in Congress. For a lot of companies, it was a customer relations question and their customer relations and communications people handed climate change. Uh, for some, it was an internal sustainability question and their chief sustainability officer helped try to clean up their internal uh, climate work a little bit. And ultimately, as pressure grew, it became an investor relations issue. But for essentially no American business, was it a serious business viability issue? So they all just backed off. And their lobbyists did nothing. Their trade associations did nothing. And the major trade associations, the US Chamber and the National Association of Manufacturers, were so captured by the fossil fuel industry that they were recently outed as being the worst two climate obstructors in America, worse than the American Petroleum Institute for Pete's sake. So this, you know, the first fact is we had bipartisanship until the fossil fuel industry crushed it. And the second is nobody in corporate America stood up to push back against the fossil fuel industry. It didn't seem to matter enough to influence their self-interested lobbying on other issues of importance. That's where series comes in to help organize this. And that's where the new understanding that the regulators have talked about, that there is a serious, even deadly risk in the financial community if we don't get this right. And the ag sector is beginning to stand up and realize, whoa, our basic business model is imperiled by doing nothing on climate change. So we in politics, we don't see the rest of corporate America, the good guys, the investors, the banks, the ag sector, the consumer facing companies, the Cokes and the Pepsis, we don't see them on the field yet in Congress, but we do see them getting their rear ends off the bench. We do see them starting to strap on their helmets. We do see them starting to talk about what their game plan might be once they get out onto the field. And when that happens, I think there's a moment of real political transformation that will happen quickly. There are plenty of Republicans who would like to do a climate bill if they didn't think it would be fatal to their careers. And there's actually broad agreement on the model, which is a carbon price that is robust and border adjustable and revenue neutral. In fact, Republicans pretty much agree on that as long as they're not subject to election consequences. So lots of think tanks and formers and so forth Here's Carlos right here, my friend, who's been uh, very much a part of that. Um, so it's actually an optimistic message that once the good guys in corporate America get off the bench and onto the field, there'll be some balance in the political hydraulics and the people are both willing to go on the Republican side and have a good Republican model that we can work with. That's great. And that sense of optimism is 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 
good to hear, particularly what's happening now. Carlos, let's ask your perspective as a former Republican congressman and, and as the senator said, a real leader on environmental issues. What's your perspective? What do you hear from your friends and former colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle? Well, Stephen, first let me thank you and Ceres for this opportunity. Uh, Ceres uh, is a wonderful organization. I had a, a, a good uh, dialogue with Ceres while I was in Congress, and uh, we've continued that now. And uh, it's an honor to be here with uh, my fellow panelists, especially uh, Senator Whitehouse. I'll tell you a quick story about him. I was a freshman in Congress, and uh, uh, someone on my staff told me one day, uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse wants to come over to your office and see you. And I said, really? Uh, it's very rare that a senator would walk across the, uh, the Capitol complex and come visit a freshman house member, but he did. And it was because he found out that much I was more glorious. In <laughs> and that I wanted to, uh, to be constructive. And, um, and that's where our friendship began. And, and I'm honored to be with him today and to, and to continue collaborating with him in different ways. Uh, but I'm actually fairly bullish on uh, the prospects for legislative action uh, in terms of climate change in the coming years, not this year, but certainly in the uh, two to three year window. Uh, Republicans are starting to wake up, some of them because they realize uh, uh, all the uh, scientific data that's out there and they, they, they process it and they understand this is a crisis that has to be addressed. Others because they know there will be political consequences if they don't and they know that young voters, especially all across the country, are demanding climate action. So things are definitely changing. Now, I was there for the beginning of that. Uh, the uh, House Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus was the first a bipartisan organization in Congress uh, ever organized to uh, have a dialogue over uh, climate change and to uh, start crafting solutions. And that group actually organized to defeat anti-climate legislation on the House for a first time that had happened under Republican control of the House, at least in the modern era. Today, we have now a bipartisan climate solutions caucus in the Senate. On the Republican side, it's led by Mike Braun, a coal state senator, right, uh, from Indiana. Uh, so things have definitely changed. And over in the House, so when I was uh, a member of Congress, the 114th, 115th Congresses, I couldn't get a Republican leader to even acknowledge this issue, to talk about it. Kevin McCarthy over on the House side is now saying that Republicans are going to be the ones who are going to meaningfully address climate change. I know a lot of people are skeptical about that, and I know that the proposals have a long way to go, but language is always a leading indicator in Congress, and Republicans have certainly shifted uh, their language, even House Republicans who tend to be more conservative than Senate Republicans. So uh, I'm hopeful that in the next Congress, there could be some meaningful action on climate change. And um, it'll be thanks to people like Sheldon Whitehouse who have been um, fighting this for a long time. And uh, for others like uh, Mike Braun, who is a newcomer to Congress, uh, who doesn't have very much political incentive to engage on this issue, but who understands that it's the right thing to do and that uh, his children and his grandchildren need him to do it. So uh, again, I'm, I'm just more optimistic than most. And I actually think that this COVID crisis is going to uh, give uh, climate action even more momentum. What, what have we learned during this crisis for now or thus far? Uh, this is about crisis management, risk management, mitigating uh, a challenge that we're facing collectively. I mean, that's exactly uh, uh, the same exact thing could be said about climate change. So uh, every day, uh, more and more Republicans are uh, shifting uh, to a healthier position. And I think that uh, that'll yield some uh, very meaningful results in the coming years. Great. Well, that's, again, that's another source of optimism and having this bipartisan support in whatever ways is possible is great. Following up on something you just said, Senator, um, how has the discussion with Corona affected people's thinking about climate and this issue of nature-based and what is the risk or is the reality that people are so consumed with Corona it hasn't? And a related question is, do you think there'll be a infrastructure legislation and is there a chance that that could be a greener future or uh, as, as part of that? Uh, I do think there will be infrastructure legislation. Um, I do think it will have a green 
component to it. Even before the coronavirus uh, pandemic, the Senate Republican controlled Environment and Public Works Committee put out a highway bill that had the first sea level rise sensitive coastal infrastructure program in any highway bill. It had robust support for electronic vehicles. And this was led by uh, the Republicans um, in that committee. So there is, I think, a big opportunity for infrastructure to be developed in a way that is consistent with the demands of our changing climate, both to respond to the threats and to try to alleviate uh, worsening them. So on infrastructure, I think the uh, cautious thumbs up uh, is very much uh, in order. I think what we're seeing on the coronavirus more broadly is that if you ignore the science, really bad things happen. And in the case of the coronavirus, they happen very quickly because the coronavirus came on in a very sudden wave. In the case of climate change, it's happening more slowly more steadily, we're a little bit the frog in the warming pan, but the lesson of ignoring science at your peril is one that has great impact in the uh, climate debate. And I think also the battering that the fossil fuel industry is taking has knocked it a little bit off its smug, arrogant political posturing. Um, and they may actually get a little bit more sincere. You've had, um, you know, CEOs of major fossil fuel companies say that they support a carbon price and then have fossil fuel forces operate to knock down carbon pricing legislation in states and to oppose carbon pricing legislation in Congress. So there, I think the two-facedness of the industry is being rattled by the perils that they're going through right now. And they may come out of it with a more sincere, um, um, with, with sincere political support behind what they have been saying, which heretofore has not been the case. It's been all talk and no political support. That's very helpful. Um, and, and at the end of this, I'm gonna talk about this initiative we're doing to virtually bring the business community to Washington on, on May 12th and 13th. We'll talk more about that in a minute on carbon pricing and those issues. I also wanna encourage our audience. We've gotten several questions already. Some have already built in, but there, there's still time. So if you have additional questions on the top right, put them in the chat function and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Let me ask first, uh, Congressman Carbello, and then back to you, Senator. What do you think, as we think about the climate crisis, what is the role of regulators, um, the Securities and Exchange Commission, Federal Reserve, FDIC, and others, as well as state uh, commissioners like banking and insurance? What do you think is their role as part of this? Congressman Carbell, let's start with you and then back to the Senator. Look, going back to this uh, issue or topic of risk mitigation, that's a big part of the job of regulators. And you've heard from, from two experts here um, uh, in the first half of the program. So uh, all of uh, this risk associated with climate, and I live uh, here in South Florida, uh, close to the Florida Keys, uh, at about sea level, not too far from the sea. So uh, uh, risk mitigation is the name of the game here in Florida. And obviously insurance issues are, are typically high profile in our state because of hurricanes, flooding, and, and other uh, risks related to nature and the environment. So uh, risk management, risk mitigation is at the heart of regulation. And uh, we should only expect that regulators will evolve the way uh, Congress is starting to evolve. Uh, to address climate change in a meaningful way that protects consumers. I mean, property values are at risk here in Florida. And we know that for most families, their home is their greatest asset. And that asset is uh, at greater risk today than ever because of rising sea levels uh, as a direct result of carbon pollution. Uh, so uh, here in Florida, we've taken some positive steps in this regard. The governor uh, the new governor appointed a, a, a chief science officer for the state to try to depoliticize the discussion and focus on the data, on the facts, on the hard evidence. And uh, he also appointed a chief resilience officer for the state, which is important, especially for coastal communities. So you see this evolution. It's good. I think we just need to accelerate it. 
right. Yeah, as a as a, a former regulator myself and as a regulatory lawyer for many, many years, there's really nothing new here that's required. Regulators simply need to do their jobs, but they do need to open the aperture of what they're looking at to make sure that climate is part of what is being considered. It's not something that they should refuse to look at. So getting the regulatory aperture opened to look at climate is important. And the second thing is that regulators demand the truth. And very often people can get in very serious trouble for lying to regulators or trying to fool regulators and making sure that they're asking the hard questions so that the truth comes out is uh, going to be a very, very important regulatory function. Widen the aperture to include climate, demand the truth and ask hard questions. And I think regulators have an enormous amount to contribute because much of what has been done to prevent climate action has been fundamentally dishonest and has been done in the sort of political swamps of uh, fake news, fake science, um, political muscle and bullying, and not in the clear light of uh, statements made under oath to regulators with uh, consequences for uh, dishonesty and misleading. Um, speaking, that's both of those are very helpful perspectives. Thank you. Speaking of kind of the clear light of what's happening, the Federal Reserve and other regulators have gotten taken a very activist role in addressing the Corona crisis, uh, whether it be the four trillion dollars of guarantees or the other programs, some new and some expanded. Will their expanded role affect the thinking for climate? Will regulators or legislators who are thinking about regulators um, think that the regulate there's more possibility for them to act? Senator, I'll go to you and then back to Congressman. Um, the concern, which I think is largely fabricated, but nevertheless, um, the concern that a correction to a clean energy economy will actually hurt the larger economy um, is, a little bit, it's belied by the facts, just for starters. Let me not give it any more credence than it's due. It's a, to my mind, it's a phony argument, but it is a very loudly megaphoned argument out into the debate. So we have to deal with it even in its, um, in my view, apparent falsehood. But this proves that we have the tools to help the economy move forward, even if going to clean energy weren't the best economic solution for everyone. And it also, I think, can show some of the tools that are available to the states and the industries that might be hard hit in this transition uh, because of lack of preparation and planning. And that we there are things that we can and should do to make sure that Americans don't suffer in this transition, that there's not groups that are left behind in the way that coal communities suffered because coal companies didn't plan for this and ended up going into bankruptcy and abandoning their employees. Congressman, do you want to add anything to that? Well, Stephen, I'll just say that, first of all, uh, there are uh, a good number of conservatives out there who I think have some legitimate concerns about the Fed's activism and, and the Fed's, uh, the broad uh, set of actions it has taken. Uh, certainly all understandable given the nature of the crisis. But if we set those aside for a second, I think what's important is that the Fed has set a major precedent here. They have responded to a crisis that is not inherently an, a, a financial crisis. It has nothing to do with toxic assets or bad loans or insolvent uh, institutions or even government action. This is a response to a public health crisis. So the Fed has essentially uh, set the precedent or declared that they have the authority and they have the imperative to act in the face of a crisis that is a major threat uh, to the well-being of the American people. And again, uh, just like uh, this COVID-19 crisis uh, is uh, putting lives at risk, is uh, hurting the personal economies of just about every single American, uh, much of that can be said uh, of climate change and what it does in terms of our public health, uh, what it does in terms of the values of our, of our properties, our homes. Uh, so this precedent setting action we've seen by the Fed in the midst of this crisis, I think will have repercussions uh, as people look into the future 
and think about how government is going to respond to climate change. That's great. Uh, here's a question for any of the four of you. I'll let you guys decide who wants to answer or, or any or all of you. Following up on what Senator Whitehouse was saying about the need to have honesty and transparency and information, what is the role of regulators to push for climate risk disclosure? This is a question actually that came in from the chat, as many of them have, uh, in order to get information to allow them to assess risk and so what information are they getting now what should we be as a regulator should we be either legislating they get or regulatory so i don't know if if again sarah raskin or mike Creel, if you want to start with that or i can go back to our legislative colleagues i'll defer to sarah <laughs> so um yeah it's a great a great set of questions and one um you know that i think bears a lot of uh, good analysis so this is the question of um of disclosure now disclosure could really be quite significant here uh disclosure would be sending investors additional signals about the long-term sustainability of their investments um, what would those disclosures look like well there's a lot of work being done um, around the world on uh, coming up with uh, standardized forms of what what good disclosures would mean and be in the context of climate uh, with a standard lexicon so people could understand, they could compare, you know, this would be not an apples to oranges problem, it would be, you know, everybody would understand and investors could, could accurately price um, and get signals regarding the value of what they want to invest in. This is what we mean by allocating, this is what markets are supposed to be really good at, right? They're supposed to be able to allocate capital to where it's most needed. And, and the way you do that is by sending signals, okay? And disclosures can play that signal. Now, a lot of times prices, you know, prices themselves should be able to do that, but if prices are not reacting uh, in a, in a long-term enough fashion, then just then there is a role for disclosure and I think we um, and I think the the regulators in the US should be thinking much more actively about um, enhancing for investors um, the role of disclosures regarding the long-term sustainability of particular forms of, uh, of investment and I don't think this is an impossible task I think there's it, this is it's up yeah yes it's a mountain to climb but it's one that that there's been a lot of effort in 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 working towards and I think it's completely achievable um, so um, so I think it's a great question and I think it's one that that potentially could actually emerge um, in this po in the post pandemic um, you know uh, arena Great. Let me put a uh, positive flag up for the Commodities Futures Trading Commission and the climate risk panel that it has put together, uh, chaired by a guy named Bob Litterman, who was the head risk uh, examiner, the head risk person for Goldman Sachs. So he has huge cred on Wall Street and in the financial services industry. He is a true professional about risk analysis and the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, obviously because of the impact of climate across so many American commodities, has a huge stake here. So even with all the counter pressure out of the Trump administration and the fossil fuel industry about not doing anything, here's a Republican dominated uh, regulator that has stepped up and put together a very well led and very authoritative committee to take on a very serious problem. And I think that's a pretty good example of what regulators need to be doing. And I give them a, a big thumbs up for doing that. And by the time the thing settled, it was a bipartisan um, agreement supported by commissioners of, of all stripes on the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. I appreciate, Senator, you mentioning that. It's, it's, a, very, it's, it's a very diverse committee. Our, our uh, CEO Mindy Luber is a member of it. They're industry folks, they're nonprofit folks, they're folks from all areas, and they're working hard to come up with a consensus. So I, I think you're exactly right in that. Let me ask one final question um, of this, this the, of, of the uh, senator in particular: that do you think that that there are opportunities this year? for regulators to take some of these steps we've talked about, mandatory disclosure, things like that, or is, are those really building for the future? And in also, Senator, you had talked earlier about a link you have with some resources, if you wanna share that before we wrap up as well. Yeah, the um, I think that um, there's a lot of work for regulators to be doing 
uh, particularly the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, they there is clearly a very big risk here. And uh, I understand that you have a way to make available a in what would in the old world be a binder that I would give everybody, but now in coronavirus world, uh, it's an e-binder, I guess, of the leading articles and warnings about major uh, economic crashes that will follow uh, unbridled uh, continued emissions. And it's everything from um, Freddie Mac warning about a coastal property values crash that would outdo the 2008 mortgage meltdown because of sea level rise making mortgages and properties impossible along our coast something that carlos uh, sees in florida all the time and has been really out front on to these banks uh that uh, commissioner raskin mentioned all around the country who are warning of very serious systemic risks if you look at the recent green swan report from the bank of international settlements it's stunningly serious language from a regulatory body so i do think there's a lot left to be done and there's a good path for regulators in the us to follow looking at what our peers uh, have done in other countries it's just unfortunate that it's the united states of america that has to be looking to other uh, countries for examples and is the follower nation we're usually a leader nation but on this issue with our fossil fuel industry and this administration uh, that makes it we're, we're in an uphill position but i understand that you're able to get that link out to people who are following i don't know how to do that um but steve if yes. you could take care of that we can get that information out to everybody who uh, is on this and if nothing else it's an interesting summary of the hazards that we face from paying no attention to uh climate and i'll close by saying how important it is for the rest of corporate america to uh, step up and to step up now if you want a congress that responds to political pressure which is what we're supposed to do you got to apply political pressure and for too long corporate america has applied less than zero net political pressure uh, to congress to get anything done uh, these concerns that everybody's been talking about today i think have enlivened uh, the desire of corporate america to show up in congress and lobby for something good they're not there yet but they're on the brink and every way in which we can prod, cajole, poke, name, shame, and otherwise uh, encourage them to actually show up and lobby for what they claim to believe in would be a good, it'll make a big difference. Well, that makes an enormous impact. And Senator, I didn't, but people a lot smarter than me at Ceres have, while you were talking, they included the link in the chat function and we'll send okay. it out afterwards. So I, my only my only frustration is for the four of you, we don't have more time, but I do want to thank you. This has been remarkable. Um, next month, Ceres will be releasing a new report called Addressing Climate as a Systemic Risk, a call to action for U.S. financial regulators we include roughly 50 recommendations that we'll build on today's conversation. We'll be sure to send that to you. Before we adjourn, I want to spend a special note to thank the sponsors on the screen. Again, without their support, we wouldn't be able to offer these kind of great conversations. You'll receive a follow-up recording on this. Also, we're doing another uh, webinar on May 5th, that is limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degrees roles for investors, companies, and policymakers. And if, if you, you can register by going to series2020.org and then following what was talked about earlier in terms of carbon prices, um, we're doing our, our virtual lawmaker education day lead on climate on May 12th and 13th. Series with many of the partners, we're bringing so far over a hundred companies signed up small and, and large from across the country to talk about this and to hopefully Congress will pass a resilient climate uh, stimulus bill. So we hope that you'll participate and you can get more information, as I say, it's on the slide uh, or at series.org backslash lead on climate. So thank you again to the four of you. Our country is better because of your leadership. We appreciate your time. And we hope that you're safe and hope everyone who's watching is safe as well. Have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. Thanks so much. Thank you.